Texas Senator Ted Cruz, presidential candidate, joins us now here in the studio. Welcome, Senator. Thank you, Brett. Good little, to be with you. A little traveling. Um, you obviously were one of the winners last night by all accounts, Thank uh, you. social media and across the board. Was that moment a planned moment for you or something that evolved? No, it, it wasn't planned. It was just as I listened to the questions rolling out that they each became more and more egregious. And it, and it became apparent that the moderators, they weren't there trying to actually help primary voters decide who to vote for. Their object was to belittle, to insult each of the candidates and to get them fighting as much as possible. And, and uh, you know, I, I just think that's ridiculous and, and, and it's not beneficial. Uh, you, you know, Brad, I mean, I ask a question. Why would any Republican primary debate be moderated by people who no one on earth thinks would ever actually vote in a Republican primary. But you know, news organizations do these debates. Do you think the RNC is at fault for how this debate structure has been? Sure, sure, because the Democratic debates are primarily moderated by liberals, and the Republican debates are primarily moderated by liberals. So they have, it's the same people by and large, and they have different objects. In the Democratic debate, th they get a ton of love from the moderators, and it's, and it's all praising the different candidates, avoiding too much clash. On the Republican side, you look at an awful lot of the media interviewers, their object is, whoever the Republican nominee is, to beat up on them and, and to have people either stay home or vote for Hillary sure, Clinton. Sure, but you're not afraid of tough questions. I mean, you have to get to a general election if you're the nominee. Uh, oh, look, I, I go on tough questions all the time, but, but, but let's have a debate that's actually useful. So, for example, last night I suggested, how about having a debate moderated by Sean Hannity and Mark Levin and Rush Limbaugh? Now, I think Republican primary voters would really like to see that. Those are strong, rock-ribbed conservatives. They're going to be voting in a Republican primary, and they're going to ask questions that actually would help people determine who's been the strongest conservative, who's been consistent, not people that are sitting there. For example, last cycle in 2012, we all remember George Stephanopoulos asking the Republican candidates, what's your view on Griswold versus Connecticut on birth control? You remember all the candidates were puzzled, they were scratching their head, what, what are you asking this for, George? And he kept asking and asking and asking, and we found out about a month later that that was the opening charge of the Democrats' made-up war on women, that it was a, 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 a so-called media person, who obviously had been a Clinton political operative, right. launching the first wave of an attack. Let's Why would our primary debates be moderated by people with an agenda of defeating whoever the Republican nominee is. Let's go to some substance here. Yeah. The question that you were asked when you went into that uh, that, that uh, comment about the, the questions that were being asked was, was about the debt yeah. limit increase yeah. and the budget deal. Um, does your opposition to it, they asked, show that you're not the kind of problem solver American voters want? <laughs> Talk about that was the question that it, was asked. It was the question. Uh, it's one you of those. Didn't actually get to the answer, but what would have been your answer? Well, and I did ultimately. They finally let me answer later on, and 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 I took what little opportunity I had to to call out the questions, and and, and I would note the biased questions that they were leveling at everybody at Donald all right, Trump. All right, but let's Carson. talk about the substance. So, so, Is there a debt limit increase bill you would vote for? Uh, of course, and and my position consistently has been that Congress should use every tool we have to rein in the out-of-control spending and debt. So, for example, I wrote a book this summer called A Time for Truth. The opening chapter, Mendacity, talks about the last debt limit fight where I argued to my colleagues, this has proven to be the most effective leverage Congress has with a president. In the last 55 times, Congress has raised the debt ceiling. It's attached meaningful conditions 28 times. So we should use it to try to help fix the underlying problem of out-of-control spending. But this time seems like a fait accompli, doesn't it? Well, well it does, and, and, and you'll recall, when John Boehner stepped down that day, I said the consequence of this is that Boehner has cut a deal with Nancy Pelosi to raise the debt ceiling and to fund all of Obama's big government priorities for the next two years. And in fact, some of the media blasted me, said, you don't know that. And I knew exactly what it meant. You look at what happened in the House of Representatives. Every single Democrat in the House voted for this because it is a blank credit card for Barack Obama. Only a handful of Republicans voted for it. And now Mitch McConnell, who is allegedly the Republican leader, is ramming through a vote at one o'clock tonight. He'll have every single Democrat there. And again, he'll have a handful of Republicans. Now, why do the so-called Republican leadership 
forced through votes that all the Democrats agree with and a majority of Republicans oppose, it's why, Brett, people are so frustrated. Do you support raising spending caps for defense, or should they stay flat? I, look, of course we should increase defense spending, but we ought to pay for it by cutting elsewhere. Okay. And Here's what uh, some of the people on Twitter, we asked for questions yeah. on Twitter. Peter Carlson wrote in, why should we elect a one-term senator who can't get along with his own party and hasn't had any real accomplishment in elective office? Well, don't know if he's a fan or not, but he tweeted in. Well, well, look, it, it, it doesn't surprise me that there are people on Twitter that, that are launching attacks. And, and, and you know what? The premise of his question is right. If you want someone that will go along and get along with Washington right now, I ain't your guy. And it's one of the striking things at that debate where every candidate is, is posturing, is holding themselves out as an outsider, is saying, I will fight Washington. And, and I think the reason, Brett, that our campaign is getting such enormous enthusiasm is primary voters are asking, okay, of all of these candidates, who actually has stood up and fought Washington, stood up and taken on not only Democrats, but leaders in their own party. And you there's a striking difference. You definitely it. have led fights mm -hmm. against Obamacare, mm -hmm. against immigration, mm -hmm. against the EPA. Yeah. But Obamacare is still around. Immigration is still exactly the same. No, 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 no. But, 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 but let's be very clear on immigration. I led the fight against Obama's amnesty, against the Gang of Eight bill, which was championed by Barack Obama, by Chuck Schumer and Marco Rubio. And I led the fight standing side by side with Jeff Sessions, and we defeated it in Congress. Amnesty did not pass. So you want to talk about fights? So a block is a legislative win. It, blocking something that is bad, that is harmful, is good. I'll give you another example. Over two years ago, following the tragic shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, the Democrats came out with a massive raft of new gun control proposals. I led the opposition against it. I, I remember Chuck Schumer being on, on Sunday shows saying they were in the sweet spot. They would, nothing could stop this. We defeated every one of those proposals on the floor of the Senate, defending the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. I'll give you another example of standing and leading a fight and winning. If you'll recall when Israel was facing rocket fire from Hamas and the Obama administration canceled all flights to Israel. And I publicly called them out and said, did the Obama administration just launch an economic boycott on Israel? They haven't done this for Pakistan, for Yemen, even much of Ukraine, and this was just months after a passenger airliner had been shot down with a Russian Buk missile. Why did they put discriminatory efforts on Israel? Within hours, the State Department's being asked, is this an economic boycott on Israel? The heat and light and pressure became so great that they lifted the flight ban okay. within 36 hours. Much has been made of Marco Rubio's missing votes, and it mm -hmm. came up in the debate. Too much, or is it a legitimate issue? Oh, listen, I, I'm not interested in the, in the back and forth and fighting. I, you know, I, I will say, the question primary voters are asking me, and I assume they're asking the other candidates, is show me where you stood and led. Show me where you stood and fought. Right, but and, and, you missed. He missed uh, 34 percent. He missed 99 votes. You missed 70 votes, uh, 24 percent. So is this t too much? About not a lot. Well, well, listen. Marco is exactly right that every senator who's run for president has missed a fair number of votes that John McCain did and John Kerry did and Hillary. Clinton and Barack Obama did. And interestingly enough, the media only seems to notice the Republicans they don't like. Now, I will say that there are choices for where, whether you show up to important fights. So, for example, let's take the last debate, the CNN debate that was in California. The next day was the vote on the Iran nuclear deal. Now, both Marco and I had fundraisers scheduled all day in California that next day. I drove from that debate to the airport to take the red-eye commercial flight all night to be here to vote against the Iran nuclear deal because I've been leading the fight against it. I ended up skipping all of my fundraisers in California. So it's the quality of the vote that uh, look, look, being there for major fights, whether it is to stop amnesty, whether it is to protect our Second Amendment, whether it is to stop the Iranian nuclear deal, or whether it is to lead the fight against Planned Parenthood. That was another vote that, that and it's not even just the votes. You know, the question that, that I think primary voters are asking is, when have you actually stood up and taken on Washington? Let me ask you a couple more things. Paul Ryan sworn in as House Speaker mm -hmm. today. You recently refused to answer a question about whether he was a true conservative. Why? Uh, well, be because as you know, I, I, I repeatedly said I was going to stay out of the Speaker election, leave that for the House to make. Um, you know, I will say 
But clearly, he's he's led a lot of fights, including listen, listen, I, I like, uh, on I, entitlement reform and other things. I, I like Paul. He's smart. I like him as a friend. I, I will say that John Boehner has started off Paul Ryan's speakership on, on a really difficult note because this deal that was cut, and I'm getting ready to go to the Senate floor and, and speak out against it, but this deal that was cut raises spending by $80 billion, raises our debt, gives in to Obama. It's a complete surrender. And, and it's designed, as Boehner said, to clear the decks, which means we will have no meaningful fights for the next year and a half. I think that's unfortunate. I will say this, though, Brett. One of the things we've seen that has shown just how hungry primary voters are for someone who will actually stand and fight against Washington is from the beginning of the debate till midnight last night, we raised $772,000 online at tedcruz.org. We're now sitting here 22 hours after the debate started. We've raised over $1.1 million at tedcruz.org. Well, th that is, more... is a real demonstration, I think, of the hunger Republican primary voters have for someone who will actually stand and fight for them. Joy writes in. Uh, she writes, you courageously stand against Congress, but as president, how will you get them to work with you? Mm -hmm. A lot of people look at you, Senator, as um, a bit divisive when it comes to working with the other side. And we see that in social media. We see it in people who characterize you up on Capitol Hill. But, but let me make a point that, that if you're going to stand against Washington, Washington will, will fight back. If you stand up against the Washington cartel, you get attacked by Democrats, you get attacked by the media, you get attacked by Republicans. And so anyone who says, I'm never divisive, that means they've never stood against Washington. That's how you are not divisive, is you don't actually take principled stands on anything. And, and, and let me point as an example. If you want to break the Washington cartel, change how this city operates, the best example you and I have seen in our lifetimes is Ronald Reagan. Now, people look back at Reagan with rose-colored glasses now and remember sunny optimism. It's worth remembering in 1976, Reagan primary Gerald Ford. You want to tick off Republican leadership in Washington, come within an inch of beating the incumbent Republican president in a primary. Right. Washington politicians loathed Reagan. Now, how did he change Congress and change Washington? Because he took the case to the people, and the Reagan Revolution was a grassroots tidal wave. So you're feeling that? That is exactly what our campaign is. You know, we, we announced today 77,000 volunteers across this country. And I'll give an example. Yesterday. I've got to run, Senator, so I'm going to wrap it up here. You feel good after last night's debate, but you have challenges ahead. You're in the middle of the pack. Look, I feel terrific. Yesterday I rolled out our tax plan, a 10% simple flat tax on individuals across the board. The first 36000 for a family of four is taxed zero. No incomes tax, no payroll tax, no death tax, and we abolish the IRS. If you go to our website, tedcruz.org, okay. you can see the you details You got it in three it. times in this interview. So. Well, I, Thank I, you I'm very much doing my time. best. I appreciate the time. <laughs> All right, we'll see you Thank on you, the trail. Brad.